Welcome everyone to the Wednesday, September 16th, Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. Uh, I call to order this meeting at 6.30 p.m. The second item is roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. We have a few new members, alternates, and uh, additional announcements. Um, a new member uh, from the city of Castle Pines, uh, Director Mulvey. Uh, she was uh, previously the alternate prior to this meeting. She is switching places with uh, Director Hudson. Uh, so Director Hudson will be the alternate and Director Mulvey will be the primary. Uh, congratulations and welcome to, uh, welcome to the board. Uh, the next one, uh, the Town of Lyons, uh, we have Mayor Nicholas Angelo um, and uh, an alternate, Holly Rogan. Welcome as well. Uh, next, uh, we have an old, uh, old uh, former, uh, former Dr. Cog a board member, Town of Lyons, um, I'm sorry, Town of Mead, Mayor Colleen Whitlow. Uh, Mayor Whitlow, uh, welcome again to the board. And uh, the alternate is David Adams. Uh, town of Firestone, we have Don Cognac. And uh, the alternate is David Whelan. And from the town of Superior, we have Mayor Clint Folsom. Uh, he was the alternate previous to this meeting. Uh, Mayor Folsom, welcome to the board. Uh, the additional announcement, we have uh, Karen Stewart uh, in attendance. She is the CEDA Transportation Commission Chair as well as the Vice Chair of the Transportation Commission. Uh, Director Stewart, uh, Commissioner Stewart, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. And with that, Ms. Stevens, roll call, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will go ahead and open up the mics now, and I will ask for people on the phones uh, to please hit star six to unmute yourself. So at this point, you should be able to unmute yourself. And, uh, I'll start roll. So we need Eva Henry, Jeff Baker, Elise Jones. Here. William Winstead. Heidi Hankel. Oh, you're in. Here. Randy Wheelock. George Martin. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Angle. Libby Zabo. I'm here. Bob Pfeiffer. John Maria. Mike Kaufman. Allison Coombs. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Present. Margot Ramsden. Adam Cushing. Present. Deborah Mulvey. Roger Hudson. George. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, I heard George. <laughs> uh, Thank God. <laughs> All right, Tammy Maurer. Mike Sutherland. Did you get Deborah Mulvey? Uh, I do now. Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, Randy yeah. Wheel. Russell Stewart. Nicole Frank. Craig Hurst. Catherine Whitman. Jackie Thomas. Steve Conklin. Here. Linda Olson. Cheryl Wink. Bill Gipp, Linda Montoya, Celeste Arner, Don Cognac, David Whelan, Josie Cockrell, Lynette Kelsey. Here. I'm here. Okay, perfect. Thank you, ladies. Sorry. No, that's okay. Rachel Binkley, Jim Dale. Here. George Lance. Dave Kerber. Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton. Tim Barnes. Jacob LeBure. Karina Elrod. 
Pamela Grove. Larry Strzok. Present. Wynne Shaw. Here. Joan Peck. Here. Ashley Soldman. Here. Nicholas Angelo. Holly Rogan. Here. Colleen Whitlow. David Adams. Paul Sutton. Sean Ferre. Christopher Larson. Julie Duran Mullica. Joyce Downing. <clears throat> Sally Daigle. Dave Black. Oh, there we go. Clint Folsom. Jessica Sandgren. Here. Herb Atchison. Anita Seitz. Here. Bud Starker. Here. Rebecca White. Adam Zarin. Bill Van Meter. Here. Okay, and uh, just in case I missed anyone, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the lines one more time. Uh, is there anyone that I missed? Jacob LeBure, I'm here. Thank you, Jacob. William Lindstedt's here. Thank you, William. All right. And with that, uh, we do have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is uh, I will need a motion to approve the, the agenda. Uh, Ms. Stevens, if you can open the lines or uh, or I, I guess uh, let's raise raise the virtual hand or press star six on the phone if you would like to make a motion to approve the agenda, please. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like we have a hand up from uh, Randy Wheel. All right, Randy, go ahead. It looks like you're self-muted. Okay, um, Randy might be having some technical difficulties, uh, so I'll move on to the next hand. Uh, we have it from George Teal. So George, go ahead. Chairman, move to adopt the agenda. Thank you, Director Teal. Do we have a second? Uh, it looks like we do from Eva Henry. Director Henry, go ahead. I second. Thank you, Director Henry. Uh, Ms. Stevens, please open the lines so we can uh, we can vote. All right, good to go. All right, uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Number four, item number four, we have COVID-19 impacts on regional economic development. I would like to turn this over to Executive Director Rex, please. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir, very much. And, and I just quickly wanted to introduce uh, JJ Ahmed. Um, we're so very pleased and honored to have JJ with us today. Um, many of you know JJ, he's the CEO of Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation. Um, and the presentation he's going to give you guys tonight is similar to the presentation that he gave to uh, the city county managers um, a few weeks back. And, and we have really enjoyed the presentation. I thought it was very insightful and um, not to put any undue pressure on JJ, but I'm sure he's going to do a bang up job again this evening. So JJ, without further ado, you're up, sir. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you and certainly appreciate the the graciousness that Dr. Cog and Doug have welcomed me uh, uh, since I took over this role now three years ago. Um, but happy to be with you. We're going to go through a lot of information pretty quickly. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me either during or after. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as a reminder, the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation, like you, is a regional entity, uh, privately funded, um, although many of our communities also participate, but 95% of our budget is coming from the private sector community. And we serve these nine counties. So the seven that most people think of as Metro Denver plus Weldon, Larimer County. So that's about two thirds of the state's population and three quarters of the GDP. We work on a collaborative model, uh, really the nation's first and, and is now the, the 
best in class model of how to do collaborative regional economic development. We don't uh, disparage one community or another. We're politically and geographically agnostic when we're trying to keep Colorado businesses here and help them grow, mm -hmm. as well as recruit those from others. And if you're not participating through your local community economic development professional, or if you don't have one, please reach out to me because we want and need your community's voice at the table. And then I thought I would share with you just a little bit about how corporate CEOs both here and around the country uh, think about Denver, because it's while we think we're um, this emerging global center of business, uh, the perceptions around the country are still a lot around outdoor recreation uh, and marijuana, frankly. So this is a talking about uh, that goes to C-suite executives around the country and around the world about the Denver that they didn't or don't know. It's no surprise that people who live and work outside of Colorado have rather limited perceptions about Denver. Sunshine, outdoor recreation, perhaps our football team. And while these are important to life in the metro region, we're here to tell you there's more, so much more. Metro Denver is a region driven by the idea of possibility. The possibility there are better ways to work, to play, and to live. And Metro Denver is more than just the central business district. From Longmont to Littleton, Greeley to Golden, it's the nine counties and 66 amazing communities, all contributing to the things you may already know about the region. And the things you didn't know. The Metro Denver EDC presents the Denver you didn't know. There's no question, Metro Denver has a robust economy. Take Denver International Airport, the Wall Street Journal recently named it the number one airport in the country. But did you know it was designed for commerce and is not only larger than San Francisco's airport, but bigger than San Francisco itself. And when you rank first in private aerospace employment, why not shoot for the stars? United Launch Alliance has more than 1,200 rocket scientists and engineers reaching new heights in aerospace, not in Florida, Alabama, or Texas, but right here in Centennial. Many Fortune 500 companies call Metro Denver home. Startups, too. In fact, we're well known as a great place for young companies to launch their fresh ideas. Metro Denver is rapidly expanding its mass transit system, increasing regional mobility and access. It's actually the largest build-out in the United States. But if a different mode of transportation is more your speed, Boulder ranks in the top four for bikeable cities. Colorado takes pride in having one of America's most educated workforces. And every year, more than 150,000 students are enrolled in our universities, prepared to start their careers. With everything happening here, it's no surprise Forbes calls Denver the number one city to do business. But companies looking to relocate or expand should know life in our region is just as enticing as work. We offer a place employees can proudly put down roots and strive for a happy, healthy future. Amenities matter. Community matters. Lifestyle matters. Colorado is one of the very few places where you can ski and golf all in the same day. But did you know golf balls fly 10% further at a mile above sea level? Laprino Foods is the world's largest mozzarella company supplying giants like Domino's, Pizza Hut, and Papa John's. And here's a juicy tidbit. The cheeseburger was actually invented here on Spear Boulevard back in 1935. If music is your jam, check out the 250 million year old sound system. Our Center for Performing Arts is actually the second largest in the country. And the beer industry is a big thing across our region boasting more than 300 microbreweries, along with the Great American Beer Festival. Plus, sports fans, we have seven professional teams, and more than six million people attend sporting events each year. Whether it's the business environment, innovations and ideas, the art scene, schools, job opportunities, or our commitment to community, there's more to Metro Denver than meets the eye. U.S. News & World Report said we're one of the best places to live in the U.S., not to mention the top economy for the past three years. It just doesn't get any better than that. Metro Denver is one region you'll be glad you got to know and call home. 
So I wanted to give you an opportunity to see kind of how we talk about Denver. Uh, and then, so we get their attention with those first four minutes worth of video, and then it's data. So we ran the Amazon HQ2 proposal, for example. The follow-on proposal is almost 600 pages. Data is the center of what we do. And to talk a little bit about how COVID is impacting, boy, when you shut down the economy, this is what happens to GDP, not unexpected. What you don't expect to see is because this is a a health emergency that's creating the economic crisis, not the other way around. The There's not 08, this isn't 2000, certainly not 1930. That's why you see the next quarter's consensus forecast for GDP is a positive 26%, even though last quarter was down 33 if you annualize. We tracked COVID, its response on the S&P is a good indicator of general markets. For the first 40 days, it tracked most closely with the Lehman Brothers failure of 2008. But as of the close today, it's at 100% of where it was when we entered the health emergency back in February. That's in large part because of the action of the Federal Reserve through monetary policy that has substantially outpaced even the fiscal policy that the Congress has authorized and that the administration has provided. We'll need to see that continue. What surprises people is because of the aggressiveness of that response, personal incomes have actually risen during the COVID emergency, but certainly that is going to end now that the the additional congressional relief is still being debated. Uh, we'll need medical innovation now or additional fiscal policy to, to sustain that going forward. But while personal incomes have risen, I'm sure that you all have seen in your sales tax collections that spending has decreased substantially. In fact, spending in Colorado has decreased a little bit faster and a little bit more aggressively than the U.S. average, both in, in low income, middle income, and high income. And this from Opportunity Insights defines high income as greater than 60,000. Well, the median income in Colorado Colorado is 68. So it's uh, more than half our state or nearly half our state. But incomes have gone up, spending has gone down, which creates a foundation on which we're going to be able to emerge from the health emergency potentially stronger than other communities. Incomes have gone up, but so have housing prices. And one of the big competitive disadvantages we have when trying to keep businesses here and trying to recruit uh, relocation or expansion opportunities from elsewhere is the cost of our housing. Uh, Boulder's now the sixth most expensive housing market in the United States. Uh, Metro Denver, not a great bargain, 12th, depending on when you measure it. And we do lose economic development opportunities because our housing prices are just too expensive, both for folks trying to stay here and grow and for folks looking to come here. We've monitored unemployment very, very closely. The blue bars here are normal W-2 unemployment. The orange bars are the addition of our non-W-2 or gig workers. And one of the things that we noticed what, because we track this so carefully is the increasing claims that were coming into the gig workers that just didn't seem to be correct when measured against our W-2 workers. And it turns out, you may have seen from the department that 77% of the gig claims just between July and August were deemed to be fraudulent. That's not just a Colorado thing. That's a national and really an international group of folks that are trying to game those <laughs> systems. Uh, unemployment is trending in the right direction, both in terms of initial claims and ongoing claims for our W-2 workforce, meaning people are starting to go back to work as policy conditions allow it. Now, uh, we do compete in a market. And so we wanna know what is our unemployment experience because if we have a much more diversified economy now than we did in the 1980s, but how do we stack up with the rest of the nation? This measures all 50 states plus Washington DC and Puerto Rico. Uh, this is state unemployment claims as a percentage of our workforce. So the orange bar across the top there is the percentage mm -hmm. of the labor force, the blue bars are those unemployment claims. And you can see that Colorado right now ranks 50th out of the 52 data points. And that's not to diminish the experience of anybody who has lost their job or lost their business in Colorado. Certainly if it was your job and your business, it is essential to you. So we're careful about our language, but it is important to know in the competitive landscape with whom we compete around the United States, only Utah among our competitor states is outperforming Colorado. So meaning we have people that absolutely need economic development opportunities to restore their jobs, but the foundation on our which our total economy can emerge, we believe is stronger than virtually anywhere else in the United States. So our mission at the, at the EDC during COVID, post COVID, it's, it's adapted, but it really isn't changed. And, and the messaging that we're approaching now is how Colorado has been resilient throughout this. And we have, again, so much more data than I have time to show you, proving the resiliency of Colorado's economy. We're pushing those messages out both locally to give confidence in the Colorado economy and certainly nationally as C-suite executives from around the country are saying, hey, 
do I put all 200 jobs back in the Bay Area or Boston or New York? Or maybe it's time that I take 100 of those jobs and I socially distance them with an office in Colorado, uh, giving an opportunity for our citizens to be rehired. So you can visit resilientco.com if you'd like to see what we're talking about to those companies right now, highlighting our resilience, highlighting the fact that we actually had the top remote workforce going into the health emergency. Uh, highlights our commitment to getting people new skills and opportunities. We, we've done actual studies of our workforce in the region to find out why they like to live here, why do they like to work here. Obviously, the investment we as a community have made in Denver International Airport cannot be uh, emphasized too much. It is the primary hub of economic activity and growth in our region. Um, and our ability to move from one coast to the other, especially if it doesn't matter where you live anymore and if you only have to be in the office a couple days a week, we're the best location to do it. Uh, both in July and August, our airport ranked number one in terms of passengers through TSA security checkpoints, and the validation is coming from the airlines themselves, both United and Southwest, remarking about how Denver has both been resilient and retained its demand better than any other market. This is a great story for us to tell. Again, I, I worked in banking for most of my career. I used to tell friends at Citigroup who were commuting two hours from New Jersey to Manhattan that you could live in Vail, Colorado, and commute to Denver for less time, even in the winter. Um, and I think that the acceleration of work remote and not being in the office full time is gonna benefit our community. We highlight reasons people like to live here, certainly with the social unrest, the fact that, that most people identify Colorado 88% as a place where they feel safe, uh, where they have a good work-life balance. 83% uh, of our community uh, chooses the community because they feel it is respectful of different ideas and is inclusive. And the rest of the nation is noticing. AGC Biologics taking over the AstraZeneca facility in Boulder, that was very important. It's not just about recruiting new companies, but sometimes we have companies leave, Chipotle, Molson Coors, AstraZeneca. So we wanna make sure that we can replace those jobs for folks that need them. In fact, the first hire at AGC Biologics was a former AstraZeneca employee. Forbes has ranked us among the top 10 communities who will emerge from the health crisis as strong. And the Wall Street Journal has picked up on that same theme with a pretty aggressive article about how Colorado can boom before and after. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. These are challenging times for our businesses, our citizens, certainly our governments, but we did have the number one economy three years running going into the health emergency, the fourth highest labor force participation rate, meaning more of our people who were here were working here. We were number one, as I mentioned, in terms of the people who are already working for home, so this isn't altogether new to us, although I think what we're learning is that you can work remotely, but it's not desired to do full time. And then our diversity, the fact that we really did on purpose since the 1980s diversify the industry clusters who were growing here meant that many people were actually hiring in Colorado even during the emergency. And then our geographic location, our quality of life, our airport uh, still give us a well, I think well positioned for post recovery hiring priorities and those practices. And so that all wraps up into resilient Colorado. But if people don't know that message, then, then it's good for us, but we need to continue to make sure people know. And so I'm gonna share with you now, this is only about 50 seconds long, so I can stay under my time. I want you to see what's going into the social channels of some of those targeted companies within those targeted industries from our region so that they can see what we're doing to talk about Colorado, invite them as, as they're considering, well, where do we put these jobs back when the economy emerges from the health emergency? How do we make sure that Colorado's positioned to get those job opportunities? This is called Room to Roam and it's what's being shared in those uh, C-suite executives social feeds right now. So you can see a little different energy 
uh, than some of the traditional marketing, but it's something that we do want. Again, it's not about moving people here. That's about moving jobs here. So those are very, very targeted. They're not general. They're going to specific companies in specific competitive markets around the country. So that's a really quick overview of the COVID, uh, how it's affecting economic development, how we're responding to it. And my phone number and email are on the screen now. Uh, we would love to have you involved. If you're not, please reach out to me at any time. This, this whole model is built on collaboration. It's, it really is a, a, a national model and certainly a North American best practice of how we do economic development regionally. But that only works if we have great collaborators and partners like Dr. Cog. So uh, appreciate the time to be with you. Happy to answer any questions if we have some time. Otherwise, please uh, feel free to reach out to me by email or phone. Thanks Thank again. Very, appreciate being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Ament. Uh, uh, board members, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Ms. Stevens, if, if there are hands or uh, if you're on the phone, please press star six. Uh, I will turn it to you, Ms. Stevens. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our first question or comment is from Kevin Flynn. Director Flynn, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, JJ. How you doing? I'm good. I, uh, I'm wondering if you could uh, talk just uh, briefly about any analysis uh, Metro Denver uh, EDC might have done on what I hear from a lot of thought leadership in terms of a new normal after COVID is over. This isn't 1918, 1920, when we didn't have as many tools as we have now to reimagine work and reimagine how people will 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 do commerce. And so there's a lot of uh, thought that maybe uh, you know downtown might not look the same. Uh, business centers might not look the same. Have you given that any consideration in your approach to uh, to the future of economic development? Thanks. Yeah, we have, Councilman. It's a great question. It's too soon to tell, really. We have all the real estate professionals, uh, commercial, uh, industrial has been off the charts in our region because of a response to COVID. We've seen some acceleration in trends that were already occurring, but it's honestly too soon to tell. We There are equal people saying uh, we're going to come back, but we're going to come back with fewer people who are going to need more per person square footage. That's one school of thought, which would say the commercial real estate, even in our urban centers are gonna grow. Uh, others suggest that no, people are not gonna load an elevator of a 55 story building the same way that they did in the past. And we can't take five hours to get everybody to their desk. So look for suburban campuses happening again. But right now there, anybody who tells you that they know the answer to that, I, I would, be cautious of taking that advice. It's just too soon to tell. We have seen an acceleration, obviously, in some trends that were already occurring. But again, remember, when when we're having folks come from other places to Colorado, even our most urbanized center is still suburban-ish to New York, Boston, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, right, so right. the the experience isn't exactly the same, but we'll see. And yes, we do keep a pretty good handle on all of the the real estate needs and what we think trends are coming, uh, but it's just too soon to say. All right, thank you. Okay, it looks like our next question or comment is from Jim Dale, Director Dale, go ahead. Thank you very much, that, that was wonderful. Uh, are, is there a video of this gonna be included so we can share it with the rest of council out here in Golden? Sure, ab absolutely, and you can see it at any time you, if you go to metrodenver.org or if you visit the resilient-resilientco.com, uh, much of this content is there, uh, so absolutely feel free or reach out to me directly and we're happy to share it. Because Golden figured prominently on that one video. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Director Dale. Uh, our next question or comment is from Elise Jones. Director Jones, go ahead. Uh, thanks, JJ, appreciated the presentation and you spending time with us. Um, I had a question about, I, I noticed all your footage showed beautiful clear skies and views, um, but the metro area has a, a lingering problem with ozone non-attainment under the Clean Air Act. It's been a decade and we're still working at it. And as a result of um, poor air quality before the fires even started burning, we now qualify for severe non-attainment, downgraded from serious. Um, I'm just curious whether or not you're starting to hear any rumblings about, gee, that's not a great thing for business and whether or not it's part of, um, whether or not you can provide a business voice to help the metro area 
encourage the metro area to get in, um, its clear skies back again. Yeah, th I mean, I would tell you that at the, long before I arrived there, uh, the creation of the Regional Air Quality Control Commission was actually an initiative of the Metro Denver EDC because you couldn't see the mountains from our brown cloud. Um, and without getting into all of the, the politics that can surround, you know, our what category we're in, I, I'd answer it this way. Uh, we have to protect the things that have made us attractive to talented and skilled workers in the first place. And if we ruin those things and talented and skilled workers decide that they want to live somewhere else, businesses will follow them and the economy will be in distress. So it is a huge priority for us. We spend money right now as an organization uh, supporting a whole host of outdoor organizations, including trying to bring the, and I think Boulder County is actually involved in this directly, trying to bring Forest Service and BLM and GOCO all together so that we can address management of our public spaces so that we don't have a conga line from the parking lot to the peak of Mount Bierstadt so that it's not a five hour drive so that we don't destroy Hanging Lake. Uh, we'll we'll lose the talented and skilled workers that drive the economy if we don't make this a great place for people to be, and that includes environmental and air quality and natural places concerns as much as it concerns tax policy or real estate. Thanks for that. I appreciate your involvement on those issues. Ms. Stevens, if, if we have one more question, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, after that, I would like to, to to move along the agenda, please. Okay, actually, at this point, we don't have any other hands raised. We're good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And again, feel free to reach out directly, but appreciate your time and appreciate your service to our region. It takes a lot to do the jobs you do, and we're we're grateful for it. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Mr. Amin. We appreciate your time. All right. Uh, the, the next item is a report of the chair. Uh, I have report on performance and engagement committee. Uh, that would be Director Flynn. All right, thank you. Let me pull up my uh, my document here. Uh, we had uh, three items really that we uh, dug into. And the first is that the uh, annual award celebration uh, will be uh, April in April 2021 at Mile High Stadium, and will be uh, rebranded as Reunion, with an emphasis on the re and the union, uh, which symbolically will. Uh, uh, celebrate our restart after this uh, very odd year and our opportunity to reunite in person, um, hopefully, <laughs> as I'm keeping, our, keeping my fingers crossed. The second item was the board collaboration assessment. We sort of did a deep dive and made the observation that the, there's been a steady improvement among the members, among the directors, and of course there's been some a lot of turnover since 2015, the first year that we did this, but it definitely shows that directors feel we are collaborating uh, much more uh, positively than we had in 2015. And that's a trend that uh, steadily increased over those years and has continued. And that's uh, essentially a good thing. And finally, the executive director evaluation has, I think everybody should have it in their inboxes, but we had, as of Monday, we had only five directors who have done it. Uh, and one of them was not me, so I'm a little bit embarrassed by that. But it does close on September uh, 21st. Uh, Jerry Stiegel has sent them out. Maybe he'll send a reminder to everybody. Uh, we have 50, we have uh, 47 people who still need to, to do it. I think this is a great opportunity to make Doug Rex sweat a little bit. So let's uh, let's take advantage of this opportunity and, and get those evaluations in. And that's my report, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, the next uh, report is report on Finance and Budget Committee. Director Conklin, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we had two action items. We approved a uh, the executive director executing a contract with Colorado Refugee Services in an amount not to exceed $85,000. And we also approved uh, him uh, negotiating and executing a contract with North Highland in an amount not to exceed $100,000 as well. Uh, and then we also uh, began the process of looking at the budget. Uh, this is our first uh, meeting where we took a look at the draft 2021 budget. We will look at that again, and then that will be before the board for action in November. And that's my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. Uh, the next item, item six, report of the executive director. Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to everybody. I uh, hope everybody's staying, staying safe out there. Um, the first item I wanted to talk to you guys about is just around the corner and is bike to wherever week. Um, as as most of you know, we initially postponed our June Bike to Work Day uh, to September, 
and then recently made the decision to cancel all in, in-person events and move to a week of virtual promotions. Um, and recognizing that many of us are still working from home and that, that we want to encourage biking of all trips, um, not just commute trips, our Way to Go team uh, will be celebrating Bike Tour Wherever Week starting this coming Monday, September 21st. Um, events planned throughout the week. Uh, Governor Polis will kick things off on Monday, on uh, uh, Monday morning on social media, and each day of the of the week will will have a theme promotions, encouraging people to dust off their bikes and ride. Whether that's uh, to the coffee shop, grocery store, or even or to work, of course. Um, you know, we just want to have fun with this event in this uh, incredibly crazy times. Um, we're still asking people to pledge to ride, so if you would like to do so, please visit bike2wherever.com and personally pledge, and please help us uh, out next week by sharing uh, social media posts and encouraging everyone you know to dish their, their cars for bikes for, uh, wherever feasible. Um, this would have been, well, I guess it is, it's still our 30th anniversary of organizing our signature summer event, um, and as you know, it draws over 30,000 participants annually. And I, I just want to give a shout out to, to both Steve and Allison and an entire Way to Go team for their commitment to promoting biking and, and being able to pivot like they have to something new and fun this year. It's, uh, it's an extremely difficult effort and I appreciate all the work that they're doing on that. Speaking of virtual pivots, um, our Citizens Academy will resume this week with a seven week course hosted on Zoom for the first time. Um, the Academy is all about helping people in our region learn more about the key issues we face and how they, they, they can become more involved and engaged in the process. We cover topics closely aligned to our, to our Dr. Cog mission, transportation, growth and development, um, some of the changing demographics that we, that, that we talk about, and ask each participant to create an action plan to focus on how they can affect change in, in, in our uh, regional community. Um, this time around, our class is a little smaller just simply because it was virtual and we wanted to make sure that uh, we could we could handle handle the amount of folks that we had in, in our class. Uh, we have 31 people from across the region that will be participating tomorrow night, which is the first class tomorrow night. Um, next time I want to guys talk to you about is we have been sending out periodicals to our partners and members in the smart cities realm for quite some time. Um, topics include smart mobility, uh, broadband, microgrids, smart healthcare, uh, smart infrastructure, and many more. Well, we've kind of formalized this into a newsletter, and we're calling it the Somewhat Weekly Smart Region Syllabus. Um, so if, if this is something that would interest you, if you're interested in this kind of innovation and tech side, um, we would love to, to add you to our mailing list. So just simply reach out to either myself or Flo Rotano, who's our Director of Partnership Development and Innovation, and we'll add you to that list. Um, the same holds true. We also have another newsletter that, that's dedicated for small communities. It's called the Hot Topics Tribune. Um, and as you probably guessed, it's geared to de and designed for our smaller communities in mind. Um, if you wish to be on that mailing list, please reach out to Flo or myself, and we'll be sure to add you to that as well. And speaking of our smaller communities, um, we are seeking feedback by the end of this week um, on, on preferred dates, times, and topics for this year's Small Communities Hot Topics Forum. Um, which will be hosted sometime this fall, uh, and that original email went out on Monday. So if you have any comments or suggestions on what the topics might be for that, we'd, we'd be uh, more than willing to, to, uh, to include those. Um, the next item is related to over the last few years, Dr. Cog has partnered with the Urban Land Institute, or ULI Colorado, to provide matching funds to support financial technical advisory panels and communities throughout the region. In August, the city of Longmont hosted a day and a half long workshop um, identifying a suite of actionable uh, strategies to uh, redevelop the Great Western Sugar Mill site. Um, ULI expert panelists provided elected officials, staff, and stakeholders several paths forward in efforts to redevelop the challenging but iconic site. Uh, the Longmont TAP uh, was, was the first virtual advisory panel in the entire ULI network to focus on site planning and design solutions. And if you're interested in the report, the report will be made available um, in the near future. Um, but for those that are interested in the outcomes of other past TAPs or, or um, technical advisory panels, please visit ULI Colorado's website to learn more about this program. 
and we'll be we'll be soliciting um, additional support or sorry uh, additional applications for those for those taps in in the in, in the coming months um, I do want to mention just one something real quick I mean in August we uh, dr. Cox submitted an application for funding through the front range waste diversion grant program and this proposal and it was shaped you know primarily by local governments across our region um, really is looking at envisioned strategies to develop data tools and capacity to understand the challenges of uh, of uh, waste diversion and and um, and how to respond to that um, so we're we're uh, we're excited about this opportunity we have we won't receive notification if we were awarded the money or not until mid, mid october but you'll be hearing more about that in the in future board meetings um, the next item is is just a heads up for now, um, and while we haven't received anything formal, uh, Dr. Cog, we have been informed by Adams County staff that they are at, uh, at least exploring with the state to become their own AAA, their own area agency on aging. Um, this is a this is a a formal process, and and um, and and what the process looks like right now is still unknown. So the, the state is still working on that process. We continue to have conversations and discussions with Adams County, and we'll keep the board apprised of any developments in this space. And lastly, um, I wanted to share some, some sad news with you all. Randy Pan, former mayor of Englewood and Dr. Dr. Cog board member, passed away on Thursday, September 3rd. He was 71 years old. And I know many of you knew Randy and know what a tremendous loss this, this is for our regional community. I would like to leave you with just one quote um, that was in his obituary, which kind of just, it really captures the kind of person that Randy was. Uh, and, and, it, and the quote is, um, quote, Randy never met a stranger. He could and would talk forever, often being teased. Don't give Randy the mic because we'll, we'll never get out of here. He knew everyone. Well, his grand, grandchildren thought he did. Randy loved the Englewood High School Pirate family, athletes he coached, students he taught, fellow teachers and coaches, and everyone he met along the way. He so wanted to, to have a positive impact on young people and help prepare them for their futures. Coach, Coach Penn, please rest in, ple in peace. And that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, our condolences to uh, Randy Penn's family. He was uh, a great mentor to me, spent time um, an effort to uh, get me up to speed on more than one occasion and uh, a fantastic human being. So God bless you, Randy Penn. Uh, the next item, uh, item seven, public comment up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment. And each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there will be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Ms. Stevens, do we have anybody for public comment, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna start by opening up the lines to make sure uh, and see if there's anyone on the phones first. If there is anyone on the phones for public comment, please hit star six to unmute yourself and you should be able to speak now. Okay, I do not hear anyone on the phones. Um, I do see a hand raised uh, for Ian Toya. I will remind you that you have three minutes to make your statement. And at three minutes, uh, I will ask you to make your closing statement. So I will unmute you now. And Ian, you have the floor. Hello, my name is Ian Thomas Tafoya, <clears throat> and I am the co-chair of the Colorado Latino Forum. Uh, I'm here to make a, a, some comments on a few issues, but I wanna start out by saying thank you, Commissioner Jones. The air may be thin here in Denver, but the pollution, it is thick. Tenth worst pollution in the country. Um, and I'm not really sure, I was really shocked to say that he's going around telling people to drive and commute from Vail to Denver for their jobs. He's completely in the wrong direction that we need to be going. I really came here today to talk about a few things. One, the massive gap that is growing uh, for 12, with our uh, climate goals. Uh, we passed a law 1261. We're nowhere near to making these targets. There's a huge coalition, more than 40 uh, organizations that are trying to raise awareness to elected officials like yourself to put, put pressure on polis to do the right thing. If we get further behind, my generation's gonna be stacked with all this pollution, not sure what we're supposed to do. 
Um, you know, I also want to point out, he's talking about how we're the second most virtual force. Well, I can tell you that only one in six Latinos can actually commute or uh, virtually commute to work. And that brings me to my second reason why I'm here. And that is that absolute concern that I have about RTD. RTD seems to be falling apart in front of our eyes. I even went through the Transit Academy, which now it sounds like it grew into a different academy here in Dr. Cog, but they're talking about massive cuts. What are Latinos supposed to do? What are working class people supposed to do? I need every single one of you to get on the phone. You're all contributing to these taxes. We need to figure out a system that is not austerity. Austerity doesn't help us reach our climate goals. Austerity doesn't help us uh, right now in the present. And then the last thing that I wanna to talk to you about is the regional issue of homelessness. You know, I see Denver, where I'm from, bearing a huge brunt of a regional homeless. We have to come up with a regional solution for the homeless. Safe camping might be a solution in the middle. We need you to put pressure at the Capitol for inclusionary housing. But what I'm seeing right now is an absolute violation of human rights for lack of water and sanitation. You know, my email is ean at clfdenver.org. We would love to talk to you. Uh, our board is made up of 11 people that have all run for office, including some current sitting council members. So uh, I want to thank you. I, have, I, have, I often listen to Dr. Cog. I don't chime in on uh, public comment, but I appreciate the work that you all are doing. It's so important that we work on these issues collaboratively and regionally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Stevens, is there anybody else for public comment at this time? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not see any other hands raised. Thank you. Uh, and at 716, we will close public comment and move on to the consent agenda. Uh, item eight, I am looking for an approval of the consent agenda. Or if you would like to talk about an item on the consent agenda, uh, you can pull it off for further discussion. Uh, with that being said, um, Ms. Stevens, is there anybody uh, who would provide uh, comments or a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like we have a hand raise from uh, Director Flynn. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move uh, for approval of the consent agenda, all three thank items. You. Thank you, Director Flynn. I appreciate that. I am looking for a second now. Okay, it looks like we have a second from uh, Nicole Frank. Director Frank. I'll second that. Thank you, Director Frank. Uh, with a motion and a second, Ms. Stevens, can you please open the line so we can vote? All right, we should be ready to vote. Great. Aye. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next part of the agenda, the action items. Uh, item number nine, discussion of project funding for the January 2021, June 2022, Human Service Transportation Set-Aside Program of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program and Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 Program. Mr. Noon, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for uh, your time today. I'm Travis Newton. I'm a Senior Program Specialist here in the Admin and Finance Division. I'm here presenting the recommended projects for the 2021 Dr. Cog Human Services Transportation Tip Set Aside and the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 uh, Denver Aurora Urbanized Area Projects. Uh, just, a couple, just a little bit of background on the two funding streams. As you all will, will recall, Dr. Cog became a direct recipient of the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding in the Denver Aurora urbanized area uh, back in December 2019. Um, that funding does provide approximately $2 million annually uh, to fund transit capital operating and mobility management projects. Um, in the Denver or urbanized area for old, that benefit older adults and individuals with disabilities. Uh, in addition, as part of the 2020-2023 uh, TIP policy, uh, Dr. Cox set aside $4 million over four years or a million dollars annually uh, for human services transportation. The HST TIP set aside uh, really is intended to complement uh, both 5310 funding and also the Older Americans Act funding that's administered through the AAA uh, for transportation services. However, this funding does go a little bit further and beyond uh, just older, serving older adults and individuals with disabilities and allowing it to serve other vulnerable, vulnerable populations, um, which was intentionally left vague to allow respondents to justify uh, what the populations are serving and that they met that 
determination that they were vulnerable. Uh, back in April, Dr. Carr released a joint uh, uh, combined call for projects for both of these two funding streams. Uh, the projects that are being recommended out of this call are intended to be 18 month projects beginning January 1, uh, 2021 and ending June 30th, 2022. The purpose for align, uh, for issuing these as 18 month projects is to align it with uh, the Older Americans Act funding that's administered to the AAA. And in doing so, this allows us to issue one larger call for transportation uh, services and projects in the region, uh, which hopefully will reduce the administrative burden um, uh, for these subrecipients, both in the amount of uh, proposals they have to submit and also the amount of subrecipient reviews they have to go through. Uh, it is important to note that this is Dr. Cog's first call for the 5310 funding. Uh, we have been administering the HST for a year at this point. Uh, however, prior years of the 5310 funding were administered through CDOT. Um, and CDOT, uh, we did issue a joint <coughs> call for these two together with CDOT last year, but CDOT is administering the, the 5310 for 2020. Uh, in your agenda packets, there is a, rec there is a table uh, of the recommended projects. Um, these projects were the applications that we received were reviewed by an independent review panel of stakeholders in the region, uh, members of different organizations uh, that that uh, have stuff going on. Uh, and then uh, these were the projects were scored according to uh, the criteria outlined in Dr. Cog's 5310 project management plan. Uh, it's important to note that Dr. Cog's staff did participate in this review. Uh, however, we were non-scoring members, uh, non-voting members. Uh, we just acted as technical advisors uh, throughout this review process. Um, I'll point you into in the direction of that table in the agenda packet again. Um, you'll you'll notice on this these recommendations, uh, the the highest scored projects were recommended for funding. Um, you also notice that we did receive uh, requests for about 6.7 million dollars, uh, and but we are only projecting that. 4.3 would be available for the 18 months um, during this period. Uh, there were two projects that weren't awarded for funding. Um, the two projects that weren't awarded for funding, the committee felt that they were limited in scope. And because they were limited in scope, they were concerned about the high cost of those two projects. Uh, in addition, the service areas of those two projects did overlap uh, with the service areas of the, some of the projects that are being awarded. So clients that can't, that would have been served through those projects can be served through other projects that are getting the funding. Uh, you'll also notice that per the Dr. Cog PMP, um, we are setting aside approximately $57,000 for the continued annual maintenance for the Ride Alliance project to support that project uh, beyond the uh, life of the grants that are supporting it at this point. Um, the motion that the recommended motion for a uh, in front of you all today is to move to approve the HST and FTA 5310 projects for January 2021 through June 2022 as recommended by the peer review panel. Uh, and at this point, I'll pass it back over to the chair. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you, Mr. Noon. Uh, board members, if there are any questions or comments, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, please. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our first question or comment is from uh, Kevin Flynn. Director Flynn, go ahead. Looks like you're self-muted. Yes, I'm sorry. I think I didn't bring my hand down. Uh, I didn't have a question. Thank you. Oh, apologies. Okay. And with that, I do not see any other hands for questions or comments. All right. With no questions or comments, I would like, I would I'm open to entertaining a motion. Uh, if somebody's out there willing to make a motion, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we have a motion from uh, Elise Jones, Director Jones. I would move that we approve the HST and FTA 5310 projects for January 2021 through June 2022 as recommended by the peer review panel. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, do we have a second? Uh, we do from Aaron Brockett, Director Brockett, go ahead. It looks like you are, oh, there you go. I'll second that. Thank you, Director Brockett. Uh, with a motion and a second, Ms. Stevens, can you please open the phone so we can vote? All right, we should be good to vote. All right, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone.
Uh, next item, item 10, uh, discussion of the recommendation of projects to be funded through the regional transportation operations and technology set aside of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Mr. McKinnon, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm the Regional Transportation Operations Program Manager here at Dr. Cog, and I hope everything is there we go. Um, and uh, we're uh, uh, presenting on the, the Regional Transport Transportation Operations and Technology Set Aside uh, Review Panel Recommendations. Uh, just a, a heads up that this is the, uh, the purpose of the program is to invest in transportation technology to support and improve uh, regional transportation operations. And in fact, you'll see that funding is recommended for CDOT, RTD, and 15 other local jurisdictions. Uh, the review panel process, uh, is back in April of this year, uh, the board approved uh, the evaluation criteria and selection process. Uh, and uh, I'm just showing this as a reminder of the, of the criteria elements. Uh, the first four items are, are MetroVision, the, the focus on uh, operations reliability and intermodal and interjurisdictional operations coordination. The need and impact uh, categories were quantitative assessments, uh, and then the risk management plan was a, an illustration of the state of project development, you know, how much the applicant uh, had uh, put into the development of the project before the application. The process that uh, we went through, the review panel individually scored the MetroVision and program objectives, the top four. Uh, Dr. Cog's staff uh, determined the, uh, the project need with a combination of the congestion mitigation process and high injury network from the, uh, the Vision Zero uh, effort designations. And based on the, the project uh, geographic scope and what uh, segments were involved, the um, uh, weighted score, uh, scores were developed from that. Uh, from the uh, emissions and congestion benefits information submitted in the applications, uh, Dr. Cog's staff translated those to common units, and then it was uh, normalized over the total project cost, and then over the, the range of, of uh, scores uh, were um, uh, allocated after that. And then there was just a, a minor uh, assessment of the risk management plans that were submitted uh, to finish off the scoring. Uh, the outcomes of the, of the evaluation was a uh, ordered list of projects. Um, and, and it's noting here like while considering uh, eligibility exclusions, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And, and then we were um, uh, uh, assessing the project values against the available capital funding, uh, which we had estimated to be 13.9 million over the next three years. Um, the uh, allocations uh, were uh, targeted to be uh, about a million dollars per phase. Uh, and so that had required a, a partial allocation uh, for the three projects that you see listed here. Uh, the exception being the Boulder project, where it was a little bit more than a million dollars in order to define a scope that was a, a natural break from a traffic operations perspective. And then uh, any of the, the remaining <coughs> projects and the projects that didn't uh, make the, uh, the cut for selection uh, were placed on an ordered waiting list uh, that I'll be showing in the next couple slides. So the uh, eligibility exclusions, uh, there were, were elements that uh, were excluded from individual projects um, uh, as described from the, um, the eligibility and selection process that the board approved uh, earlier this year that I mentioned. And they were just uh, eliminated from the applications and, and the uh, project sponsors were notified. And then there were two projects that were ultimately determined to be ineligible uh, for uh, various reasons uh, related to the eligibility uh, um, list that we had created at, uh, earlier this year. So as is included in the uh, the packet is the, the listing of the of the projects. We have them here in the order of the, the criteria ranking and uh, the federal amount is shown with a cumulative um, amount. And 
I think that what we have here is a solid set of projects that uh, is uh, has a, a, a big focus on improving uh, situational awareness uh, for the operators and uh, to understand what is going on, but also uh, improving some um, just more foundational elements. A lot of these are getting the communications foundation required to allow uh, more advanced uh, applications. Uh, and so the, all these projects set the stage to implement advanced technology capabilities and services for, for our region. I'll also point out that uh, the cumulative total at the very bottom, bottom right-hand corner um, is greater than the capital uh, that we had identified going into this. Um, I think that it's it, we want to be sure to uh, fund all of these projects, and so the uh, recommending some of the funds from the Dr. Cog traffic operations uh, be reallocated to cover the difference. And I also mentioned earlier the waiting list. So these are the projects on the ordered waiting list, uh, with showing that the, some of the remainders of the projects that didn't get the full. Um, request and some of the projects that had the, the lower scores in the ranking. On this next slide, uh, I'm just showing how the funding is programmed over the three-year period. Uh, you know, on the applications, the applicants indicated what fiscal year they would like the funding. And uh, for the most part, we were able to uh, uh, assemble the program that uh, satisfied those requests. Uh, there were a few projects that had to change uh, to a different fiscal year, and the, the applicants were notified, and, and with their consent, we were able to move ahead with uh, this programming uh, as recommended. So the motion before the board is to please uh, approve the FY21 to 23 RTO and T set aside project funding awards and waiting list recommended by the project review panel. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, board members, uh, questions or comments? If so, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question or comment is from Bill Gipp, Director Gipp, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say Erie it was lucky enough to make it uh, just barely onto the end of this list. And our town staff wants to thank everybody involved for the, the equity, the cooperation, the open communication, uh, and really the straightforward kind of way of working out, working all this out together. And so, yeah, I, I'm going to be recommending approval and thank you to everybody involved. Okay. All right, and with that, I do not see any other hands raised. Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, going through the list of projects, it looks like everyone who submitted got a project approved. Sure, there's some on the waiting list, but every community or every application uh, within a community got approved. So the, the, the board members that are out there, new or smaller communities, uh, I would just encourage you to uh, interact with your with your staff and um, ask the question or to create awareness on these set asides. I started doing this again. Um, Mayor Penn uh, was was one of my uh, one of my mentors, and he said you got to get involved. Um, so hopefully um, you can you can go back to your communities and start that conversation, create awareness and fill out an application and be like a Parker or an Erie and getting funded for a project that could improve your community. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to call for a motion. Uh, if, if there is somebody who would like to uh, recommend a motion or provide a motion, please raise your virtual hand or press star six. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like we have Bill Gipp, Director Gipp. And of course, I will motion to approve the uh, FY21-23 RTO and T set aside project funding awards and waiting list recommended by the project review panel. Thank you, Director. Uh, do we have a second? It uh, looks like we have a second from Director Teal. Director Teal? Second. Thank you, Director Teal. Uh, with a motion and a second, Ms. Stevens, can you please open the line so we can uh, vote? Absolutely. Director should be able to vote. All right. All those in favor, favor please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? 
Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, the next section of our agenda, informational briefings. Uh, item 11, 2050 small area household and employment forecast for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Taylor, please. Right. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. I'm Andy Taylor, and I'm on the line to talk a bit about the small area forecast that's used in the regional transportation planning process here at Dr. Cog. I like to use this metaphor of a relay race to talk about where small area forecasting fits in the regional transportation planning process, because we're not the first leg. Uh, the work starts before us with the state demography office. They're charged by state statute uh, with creating forecasts for population, households, and jobs. And they do this work at the state and county levels, publishing and updating forecasts for the county's annual We're the next leg. While they stop at 64 counties, we have to take their forecasts, what we tend to call control totals, and distribute that growth across 2,800 small areas, what we call transportation analysis zones or TAS. Our forecasting work must stay nested within these county control totals. With this information at a TAS level, uh, Dr. Cog and others can conduct travel demand modeling in order to forecast future travel patterns. Uh, the relay race metaphor will now fall apart when I mention two feedback loops that happen outside the regional transportation planning process. Uh, the first is on the far right in the bottom corner there, uh, what we're calling the MetroVision gap analysis. MetroVision is the region's plan for the future, with the current version adopted unanimously by the board back in 2017. Uh, one of MetroVision's long-standing principles is that it respects local plans. It's not our job as Dr. Cog or Dr. Cog staff to override local plans in zoning and, and uh, and zoning in our forecasting work. Uh, however, another of MetroVision's longstanding principles is that it offers ideas for local implementation. And so we intend to start highlighting the gap between what this forecast is showing and our region's aspirations uh, in order to further the conversation about local and regional decisions that affect growth and development. Uh, the second feedback loop there is uh, in the middle, uh, our coordination with the State Demography Office on future county forecast updates. We're planning to work with them in 2021 uh, to help local governments provide some constructive feedback on the state's county forecasts. Under current processes, that office publishes preliminary forecasts around May or June of each year, uh, and then they solicit feedback from the counties and other local governments, and then they finalize that forecast each November. Uh, the work we intend to pilot would help local governments see how the changes in, uh, to the forecast might affect their jurisdiction and thus help them and their neighbors argue for changes uh, to these control forecasts. I've got more process slides later, but I just wanna look at, uh, start by looking at the forecast that we're working with in the region. By 2050, we'll be just shy of 3 million jobs uh, and 1.9 million households under this forecast. Please note that the 2020 reflected here is a pre-COVID forecast of 2020. Mm. Uh, so let's look at this decade by decade. Uh, the narrative around this last decade has often used terms like rapid growth. And surely some of that uh, job growth represents recovery from the Great Recession. And we're actually uh, notably looking to add more households uh, this coming decade, uh, the one that we're just starting than we did the last. And I've got some context to explain why and why that may not be a given. But I also want to point out that the, the last 20 years of our forecast, that 2030 to 2050, show slowing growth, growth as some uh, demographic realities start to catch up with us. So let's actually put this forecast in some context. Uh, we're actually expecting less growth over the next 30 years than we received over the last 30. I put percentage change on there even though it's hard to, without the absolute numbers, to see where the change is growing from, because it reminds me to mention just how big the growth was compared to where we started in 1990. Our economy in terms of jobs came close to doubling, 
uh, between 1990 and 2020. And we're not even going to grow by that number going forward from a larger starting point here in 2020. We really can't characterize our growth as rapid if we compare it to the last 30 years we just came out of, and we can't necessarily assume uh, that our past is a template for planning for the next 30 years. But I've got some more explanation here. Uh, the first caveat is that all this material is borrowed directly from the State Demography Office. Uh, the key point is this first point. Uh, we still have a strong growth rate compared to the nation, but both rates are declining. Uh, some of that household growth that you saw 20 to 20, 2020 to 2030, that's being driven by the second point on here, uh, that we're facing an increasing number of retirements and we'll need to bring in labor through migration. Uh, this is not a given. Uh, open questions maybe, will millennials uh, reaching peak home buying years find entry-level stock or move to a region with more attainable housing? Will these workers potentially migrating in from other parts of the country or world still find potential income here worthwhile? after factoring in housing costs. There's just a lot still at play here. Uh, our long run slowing is about demographics. We've been experiencing lower birth rates since about 2007. Uh, that compounds as those once potential kids aren't necessarily there in the future to have kids of their own. An older population also means lower fertility overall and a higher propensity to move away, uh, decreasing our net migration numbers. A tightening labor market is also due to demographics. It's just a matter of who is of working age, uh, which will also likely contribute to slowing job growth. And so I've just got, uh, with that important context, I just wanna dwell on some process slides to what we've just been through before I show some, some, some maps uh, of what the forecast uh, shows. Uh, 2019 was a big year for model improvements. We moved our operations to the cloud. We improved how we estimated our future capacity for jobs and housing, based more closely on local zoning, and we added in the ability to factor in some scheduled development for more near-term improvals. Uh, you've already seen some of our work in the first couple quarters of this year during forecasts for the scenario work as part of the regional transportation plan. Uh, we used uh, regional control totals for these scenarios, pooling those county control totals together, which gave us a bit more ability to differentiate location choices uh, between the different scenarios. What you're about to see uh, in this regional transportation plan forecast, uh, we'll be using county control totals instead of this pooled regional total. So even while you were seeing and discussing some of the scenario work, we were pivoting to the small area forecast based on county controls. Uh, May, June, and July were the most important months as we reviewed nearly 600 comments from 29 jurisdictions. Combined with our comment period last September, we heard from a total of 31 jurisdictions and, and nearly 900 comments. And now we're here today to share the results, uh, which are also available on our data catalog. Let's start with our 2020 and 2050 household forecasts. The darker the area, the more households. White or transparent doesn't necessarily mean no households, it's just below the threshold that we used for this map in terms of concentration. Often we look at these forecasts, we have a tendency to dive right in and look at just what's happening in the change between say 2020 and 2050. But what I like about starting here is reminding ourselves that there are already a lot of households in the region and seeing just how many parts of the region look largely the same. But you know, use this same set of maps for jobs. If you're picking out areas you were hoping to see highlighted on these maps, but don't, uh, please hold on for the growth maps where you may see uh, new points of, of concentration or intensity or growth emerging. Uh, and remember that we also have a limited amount of growth to work with in our control totals. And so here are the maps showing change between 2020 and 2050. Uh, uh, the darker the color, the greater the intensity of growth uh, in this series. Uh, this whole series of maps is available as PDF download alongside the, the, the richer spatial data on our data catalog. And in case you want a, a printable version or a version you may be able to zoom in and see better than what you can see on our screens here. And so um, 
we're here before you uh, as uh, bringing this information about Dr. Cog uh, potentially using these forecasts uh, as part of the uh, transportation demand modeling and air quality conformity work uh, for the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, we're also at work right now, my team has pivoted to preparing additional analysis to inform this discussion, what I mentioned earlier about the, this MetroVision gap analysis, trying to understand what's the difference between this predictive forecast and some of the aspirations uh, in MetroVision. And we're hoping to bring that as soon as uh, early October board work session for further discussion. Uh, we also have more activities uh, coming uh, from my team uh, looking at revisiting some of our predictive models, especially in light of all that feedback that we receive from local governments. Uh, it's just really valuable to understand uh, those aspirations, something that our predictive models can't always pick up on the nuance uh, that, that local, uh, local staff and others see. Uh, we also are looking at some other improvements uh, to, to how we run our control totals and that additional collaboration I mentioned with the State Demography Office into 2021 uh, with their forecasts. And with that, I'll turn it back over uh, to the chair in case there are any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Uh, board members, if there are any questions or comments on this item, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six if you're on the phone. Ms. Stevens, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, give everyone just a moment for any questions or comments. Okay, it looks like we have a question or a comment from uh, Rachel Binkley. Director Binkley, go ahead. Hi, uh, my comment or question is, do you see any of these numbers changing or will we be looking at the new census for any of these numbers? We definitely see um, 2021 uh, as a, a year where we may see some significant changes. Um, right now, because of the timeline for the, the regional transportation plan and needing to have a new plan, we, we needed to solidify these assumptions for use right now. Uh, but we are definitely going to be keeping an eye on uh, the new numbers. The State Demography Office really relies on those for their estimates. And I think trying to also understand uh, this current uh, uh, recession that we're in and what the shape of the recovery might be, how that may begin to affect uh, some of our long-term forecasts. Uh, we definitely think that even what the State Demography Office puts out this November uh, could start to, to affect uh, uh, what we see uh, in, in uh, compared to what we've sh we're showing today. And uh, the 2021 versions preliminarily could uh, be even uh, more different. So we do anticipate that in 2021, uh, we're hoping to, to go through a process where we're going to at least be prepared uh, each year to update uh, our small area forecasts in case there is an amendment to the transportation plan. And so we will be keeping an eye on all this. Thank you. All right. And with that, I do not see any other hands raised. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. I appreciate uh, you. your time and your, your presentation. Uh, next item, committee reports. Report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Director Jones, please. Why, thank you. So, um, I don't know if folks know um, CDOT staffer Tim Kirby. He um, decided to leave CDOT. He's been the liaison uh, to the MPOs um, and the stack for a number of years. He's working to, he's leaving to work on the concept of road uses, usage charges excuse me so i don't think he's going away from that metro area or transportation but he's leaving cdot um, we received a presentation from colorado energy office and cdphe on their greenhouse gas roadmap process um, as you probably remember um, this is the process that's uh, being undertaken by the state to figure out how to reach the uh, state climate goals that were um, passed by the legislature in 2019 so we had a discussion about the role of transportation emissions um, in that uh, big puzzle, because transportation now has uh, become the top source for greenhouse gases. Uh, Stack also is making some changes to its bylaws. Um, and then last but not least, we had a presentation from CDOT on the National Highway Freight Program. 
That's a funding program that CDOT administers with input from the straight State Freight Advisory Committee. And there'll be some uh, call for projects at some point in the future, but they don't know the date yet because um, we're waiting to see what Congress does with the federal transportation bill. So that's my update. Thank you very much, Director Jones. The next report uh, from Metro Mayor's Caucus. I, I don't believe uh, Director Atchison is in attendance tonight. Uh, is there a mayor who would like to provide an update? Please raise your virtual hand and press star six. And Ms. Stevens can uh, call on you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we have uh, Director Starker who is willing to give the report. Mr. Starker. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we, the uh, Metro mayors met in full caucus on the 3rd of September. We had a briefing from uh, Bob McDonald, the director of uh, Denver Public Health and Environment on the COVID-19 uh, <clears throat> progress in the, in the city and county of Denver, which uh, it was uh, positive. Uh, we had a report from Mayor Jackie Millay on reimagining the RTD. And uh, <clears throat> subsequent to our meeting, we did uh, draft a, a, a consensus letter to uh, be sent around to the mayors asking RTD to uh, maintain the uh, Fast Tracks internal savings account, the FISA account, uh, for its intended purposes uh, as the uh, voters um, uh, voted on in 2004 that we continue that and not take those funds for another one. And we were looking for uh, consensus on that. On that uh, direction. We had a discussion on the opioid settlement and um, uh, the some of the uh, uh, different uh, uh, opportunities there to engage on that either with the uh, Secretary of State, uh, uh, Mr. Weiser's uh, proposal or an alternate uh, on the, on the um, coalition. And then we also uh, this, uh, sent a, a letter, uh, had consensus to send a letter from to our congressional congregation uh, delegation, extending the deadline for uh, for use on the CARES funding from uh, uh, December until uh, March of 2021. And that uh, concludes my report. Thank you, Director Starker. Uh, next report, report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We actually had met twice. We're trying to make up for some lost time since our last Dr. Cog board meeting. Uh, our first meeting was uh, focused on the CARES Act funding, which we all are very familiar with. And, and uh, we know that some of the counties receive that directly and then some also through the state fund. And so there's some very creative ways, so a lot of sharing to, uh, to uh, help communities help our citizens to improve themselves through this CARES funding. So it was a really good discussion. And then our last meeting was on homelessness. So a lot of creative ideas because we know there's been some extra challenges. So it was uh, even uh, ranging from purchasing buildings to the point of faith-based uh, systems that are really stepping up to solve some of the homelessness problems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes the report. Thank you, Director Partridge. Uh, next item, report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. Ms. Sanchez Warren, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we talked about the challenges starting to serve older adults in the community again. Uh, the biggest challenge being restaffing. Uh, a lot of uh, community service-based providers had to lay off staff and now they're having challenges figuring out or finding new staff as well as figuring out what the right staffing level is because service demand has been um, uh, unreliable. Some people don't want, still don't want uh, to have people come into their homes and some don't want to go out. Uh, you know, the older adults are among the most vulnerable um, to COVID and have the highest rate of, of death uh, from COVID. Um, the, uh, there's another, you know, there's a lot of funding right now uh, with COVID relief funding, but providers are reluctant to take that because they're worried about being able to sustain the services that they would be able to add uh, once COVID funding is gone. And we're all worried about what uh, the budget, Colorado State budget, will look like uh, next year. So there have been stops and starts. Uh, 
as uh, we, we tried to bring up a couple of congregate meal sites. And then, for example, there would be an outbreak. There was an outbreak in Arvada. So um, they started, we decided not to start that congregate meal site until uh, probably sometime in October. We also had a report from the uh, Shannon Gimbel, our ombudsman. Uh, she reported on the facilities. There are were, there were 118 facilities that have resolved their COVID outbreaks, but we had 15 new uh, uh, outbreaks in, uh, in facilities, nursing homes, and assisted living in the last two weeks. So still an issue in, in long-term care facilities and something we have to watch. We also talked about our procedures in the ombudsman program as uh, the governor residential strike team gave procedures for outside visits and now inside vis visits, how we're going to do those and um, how we're reaching out to family members virtually as well. Um, the last report was on the grant outreach. You know, we got a, uh, a grant to focus on hard to reach older adults and we subcontracted with many of our community service providers to help us get the word out collectively. We um, contacted almost 1.5 million people through various methods. That's pretty huge. Um, our social media posts were viewed over 35,000 times. So we feel very proud of that effort and um, really like the collaboration between us and our and our uh, contracted service providers to to get the word out to um, uh, get folks counted. That's my report. Thank you very much, Ms. Sanders Warren. Next uh, item: report from the Regional Air Quality Council Executive Director Rex, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir, very much. Um, so at our Meeting last Friday, uh, there were some committee reports, the Control Strategy Committee update and the Operations Committee update, which are standing items on, on, in, on the agenda. Um, we reviewed the uh, 2019 audit, uh, and that was a clean audit. Um, ozone season update, some of the, the readings were presented to date on, on air quality. Um, as you know, we've had a, a rather difficult year at, at some of our monitoring locations throughout the region. and. Uh, quite frankly, has forced us to have a conversation about the possibility of us, or the probability of us um, uh, being redesignated um, at some future date to, from serious to severe. Um, so we really need to have a, a really good year next year in order for that not to happen. Um, we had some discussions about the, this uh, serious area SIP. There was an update provided on the RACT chapter or the reasonable, reasonably available control technology chapter. And uh, had a conversation about the, the preface to the document that basically makes note of the um, the uh, air quality readings that we had this past summer. That is it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, the next item: report from the E470 Authority. Director Teal, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the E470 uh, Authority Board of Directors did meet on September 10th. It was a brief meeting, however, um, and only a few items of business were discussed. Um, so that then the board could uh, adjourn to their uh, to the second part of this year's uh, board retreat. Um, it, there, I believe it's a three part. Uh, and correct me, of course, Chairman, if I'm incorrect on that. Uh, board retreat just due to the fact that some of the challenges we're having with COVID. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Teal. Uh, the next item, report from CDOT. Director Wright, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. I think uh, tonight for CDOT, I'll just give you an update on the, the wildfires um, that really impacted our state, uh, our highway system, and our uh, CDOT was involved in many of them as well. Um, all told, there were four fires we were tracking pretty closely. The Cameron Peak Fire at 102,000 acres, Pine Gulch at 139,000 acres, Williams Fork at 12,000 acres, um, but really most impactful to our highway was the Grizzly Creek Fire um, at, near Glenwood Canyon, which resulted in the shutdown of I-70 for a, a pretty extended um, number of days there. That fire was 30, only 32,000 acres, um, yet has been declared a natural disaster. 
there was about $10 million in damage to our sort of state highway system that uh, we'll be seeking reimbursement from, from FHWA because of that declaration. Uh, so uh, now our attention turns to the burn scars. Um, it takes about three to five years for vegetation to reestablish in those areas. So there's a, a real risk of flooding uh, as we see uh, storm events that come in and wash, uh, wash the hillside down. So that's our next focus. But uh, a really hard set of weeks for the state. Um, and uh, you know, fortunately, I think CDOT was able to help quite a bit. But um, tough wildfire season so far, um, not over yet. Uh, I'd like to just the other thing I'll touch on, uh, thank you to Director Jones for mentioning that Tim Kirby has left CDOT, a huge loss um, for our, us and, and the Division of Transportation Development. But as a result, I am looking for a statewide planner. So uh, if you know of anyone truly fantastic, please send them my way. Thank you, Mr. Chair, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much, Director White. Uh, next item, report on fast tracks. Director Van Meter, please. Thank you, Chairman. I have three items tonight. The first is that the RTD Board of Directors selected Deborah Johnson, who is currently the Deputy CEO at Long Beach Transit in Long Beach, California, to be the new permanent general manager and CEO for RTD. And there is an expectation that she will arrive to assume her position in November. Secondly, as widely reported by RTD and the press, the RTD board is currently working to provide guidance to staff on how to close a projected $215 million gap in the RTD budgets for both fast tracks and the base system for 2021. Their overarching guidance is based on a strategy of preserving as much service as possible, focusing budget cuts on other areas like deferring projects and programs and reducing administrative costs as much as possible. In their study session last night, the board heard the latest staff recommendations from the internal task force assigned to address the budget gap. Those recommendations include a wide range of cost-cutting measures, including furloughs and pay cuts for many higher paid staff. Most board members indicated that they're supportive of higher cuts in pay for salaried staff than recommended, especially for senior staff. The recommendations also include layoffs, currently estimated to total 550 positions within the agency among both salaried and represented or union staff. Recommendations also include service cuts and the deferral of projects, including the RTD contribution towards the purchase of the Burnham Yard and a new maintenance facility. RTD's electric bus procurement scheduled for next year and State Highway 119 commitment uh, in 2023 would move forward under the current staff um, proposal. They also assume the use of future FISA, Fast Track's internal savings account contributions to support closing the Fast Track's budget gap. Regarding the FISA, at their September 1st study session, the board indicated that they are not okay with using the existing FISA balances to help address the shortfall, except possibly for State Highway 119. Finally, the board has indicated a preference that staff develop a two-year midterm financial plan for RTD this year instead of the usual six-year projection, indicating a concern regarding the uncertainties around budget forecasts mid-COVID-19 pandemic. And then last, but certainly not least, some good news. The end line is on track to open next Monday. The event will be live streamed starting at 10 a.m and the first week will feature free rides on the service which you may recall is a 29 minute ride on the 13 mile long corridor between east lake and 124th station and union station regular service is planned to start at noon on monday and that chairman completes my report thank you very much director van meter the next section of the agenda informational items the next Five items are in your packet. Please use your own time to review. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Cog's staff. The next section is administrative items, item 18. Our next meeting is October 21st, 2020. 
The next item, item 19, other matters by members. If there are any other matters by members, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, is there anyone? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do have a hand raise. It is from Linda Olson. Director Olson, go ahead. And it looks like you're self-muted. Uh, there is a chance uh, she might be having technical difficulties because I am not hearing anything. And unfortunately, it's on her end. Ooh. All right. Um, Ms. Stevens, should we give her uh, some more time or should we move on? Um, I, I guess I would leave that to you, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know about the, the, the technical difficulty part of it. I, I'm, I'm happy to wait a little bit longer. Um, I just don't know how the technical difficulties potentially get resolved by Director Olson. Sure. Um, and it looks like she actually lowered her hand, so maybe she'll present it at the next meeting. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with no further matters before this board, at 8.05, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.